So I'd like to introduce you to uh, the second course uh, in basic plasma physics. Uh, this time we're going to talk about the history of plasma. So when uh, blood is cleared of the red corpuscles, there remains a transparent liquid, and this was called plasma after the Greek word, which means a moldable or jelly-like substance, by the great Czech medical scientist Johannes Perkinji. Um, the Nobel Prize winning American chemist Irving Langmuir, one of my heroes, first used this term to describe an ionized gas in 1927. Langmuir along with his colleague uh, Louis Tonks was investigating the physics and chemistry of tungsten filament light bulbs with a view to finding a way to greatly extend the lifetime of the filament. Um, the filaments basically burnt out um, over a short time and the bulbs were also coated with uh, dark material. So while studying um, how to improve uh, light bulbs, uh, he developed uh, a theory for plasma sheaths. Um, and he was looking at basically uh, surface science, the deposition of materials uh, on the surfaces. He also discovered that in certain regions of the plasma, you could see striations or uh, various dark and uh, light uh, sections within uh, a tube plasma tube and these are ionization waves um, and they show a periodic change in electron density which are now termed Langmuir waves and so this was really the start of plasma physics and in many ways uh, Langmuir was the father of plasma physics and also indeed the plasma the father of uh, surface physics this development of plasma physics um, was very important for uh, a number of areas, one of them being radio broadcasting. Um, it was discovered that radio waves would basically travel in a, like light in, in a single direction, but they would bounce off the ionosphere, which is a plasma, uh, a number of, say, 100, 40, uh, 40, 50 to 100 kilometers above the Earth. They would bounce off this layer, this plasma layer, and that meant that radio waves could travel around the world. Also, astrophysicists, people studying uh, the, the, the planets and solar systems, uh, galaxies, realized that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the universe actually also consisted of plasma. Um, sunspots, solar flares, the solar wind, star formation, aurora, all of these uh, astronomical phenomena are, in fact, plasma. Um, one of the pioneers in the area of, of, of the study of plasmas was Hannes Alphen, uh, who developed the theory of magnetohydrodynamics. MHD uh, is a theory which is used to explain uh, uh, various uh, events such as sunspots and solar flares, um, the solar wind and star formation, and uh, other, er other areas of and other topics in astrophysics. So MHD theory became very important in the study of astrophysics, but and also had applications on terrestrial plasmas in areas like fusion. Two uh, areas of particular interest to MHD theory uh, are, are the idea of magnetic reconnection and the dynamo theory. Magnetic reconnection is a process where magnetic field lines suddenly change their topology. Uh, it can give rise to very sudden increases in conversion of energy. Uh, from, from magnetic energy into thermal energy, and this can accelerate particles, as well as, um, as, well as accelerating parts of very high energies. Uh, it, it, it is also thought to be uh, the, the main mechanism behind solar flares. Dynamo theory studies how the motion of MHD, of a MHD fluid can give rise to generation of macroscopic magnetic field. And this process is very important. Uh, in terrestrial and in solar uh, magnetic fields, um, which would decay away very, very rapidly uh, in astro astrophysical terms were they not maintained by this dynamo action. The Earth's magnetic field is maintained by the motion of its molten core, which can be treated as an MHD fluid to a reasonable approximation. The creation of the hydrogen bomb um, in 1952 generated a great deal of interest in controlled thermonuclear fusion. Uh, basically, the thermonuclear bomb was created by a fission bomb, which is where 
heavy particles break away and create energy and the energy created by this fission bomb was then focused into uh, a target of, of uh, hydrogen or, or lithium and uh, caused uh, confinement of that uh, uh, particle of those particles while uh, huge energy was given to them as well so uh, leading to fusion um, and there's been uh, quite a bit of work to create fusion in, in magnetic confined systems on uh, on Earth, and uh, that, that work continues. Um, James Van Allen uh, discovered 1958 uh, the Van, Al Val Van Allen radiation belts surrounding the Earth um, using data transmitted by one of the uh, US Explorer satellites. Um, this marked a systematic exploration, exploration of the Earth's magnetosphere by a satellite and opened up the field of space plasma physics. Uh, space scientists borrowed, borrowed many of the theories of plasma trapping magnetic fields from fusion research and the theory of plasma waves in the ionospheric phys physics, um, Whistler waves and other, other mechanisms. The notion of uh, magnetic reconnection as a mechanism for energy release and particle acceleration was also uh, of interest. Um, in the 60s then, the development of lasers um, uh, la the laser action had been predicted by Einstein, and um, although it, it it could have been observed anything from the 20s onwards experimentally, it wasn't until the 1960s that it was actually shown in the lab. Um, and most lasers in the early days were actually produced by plasmas. The plasmas were able to create a non-equilibrium um, uh, optical uh, st uh, density uh, states that allowed the laser action to be seen um, and these lasers co2 lasers etc were very high power lasers um, and they could be used to ablate material and when this material was ablated it was ablated at such an energy that plasmas would form and this became the whole area uh, pulse laser plasma um, laser plasmas tend to have fairly extreme properties in, uh, in terms of densities of the plasma are close to the densities of the solid material and that would not be normal in most gas plasmas where the densities tend to be quite low uh, and in the last two de decades the the range of plasma applications has grown rapidly um, one of the big areas in the 80s was dry etching where plasmas replaced with wet etchers wet etching uh, of semiconductor materials for, for producing transistors. Um, the plasma etch, uh, the plasma could be directed um, and you got anisotropic etching where you could etch uh, lines uh, deep into a silicon material and those lines could be very, very thin of the order of microns in the 80s and 90s and dropping down out to nanometers and devices as, as small as 10 to 12 nan nanometer are now possible. Um, that would have been unthinkable uh, in the 80s when dry etching started. But plasma, plasma processes have spread into a wide range of other areas, from medical uh, applications um, to materials, um, some phones now that um, are water repellent, etc. Uh, these use plasma technologies. So that's uh, a brief history, if you like, of plasma technology. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, bye.